The Holy Gospel for this fifth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Matthew chapter 28, uh, beginning with verse 16. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going up to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can be seated. Well, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and be with you this morning and to just uh, bring a message about mission. Uh, I'm glad to be here on a Sunday when CLBI students are here. Doing in the lives of young adults who know him and who love him who are opening their hearts and their minds and their lives to the possibilities that God has for them. I think they are the future. I pray that God will turn each one of them into kingdom provocateurs, people who will go out and change the world uh, for the Lord Jesus. Thanks, Greg, for the invitation. Um, this morning we want to focus, as Pastor Greg said, on mission. We're going to come back and share with you, Lord willing, in June, uh, more specifically about the work of... World Mission Prayer League. Is it me or is it that? Okay. Um, we'll come back in June. By that time, uh, Pat and I will have traveled to China and Mongolia. And uh, depending on how things go in Sochi this week, maybe in, into Russia. We'll see. Um, uh, but we will also be spending a lot of time with some of our missionaries around the world. And then also at our annual candidate and staff retreat and mission, and mission training course in Minneapolis. What does it take to engage in mission in the world today? I wanted to share some thoughts about that with you this morning. It's important that each one of us have a vision for what God wants to do in our lives. You know, vision and mission statements are really essential for corporate entities today. But it's also important that if we have a mission and vision statement, whether it's an organization like World Mission Prayer League or it's a, it's a bank, it's important that we do what our vision and mission statement says we do. And I've actually been in some corporate buildings and corporate offices sometimes where the vision and mission statement is so vague, so benign, that they could do nothing and still fulfill their vision and mission statement. And so we want to be specific about what the mission and vision is for God's people. And so this morning I want to just touch on four things. First of all, if we are to participate in the mission of Christ in the world, we need to know Christ. Secondly, we need to be praying about the advance of his kingdom. And thank you, gentlemen, for coming up and praying for these young adults. Thank you, Greg, for praying for them. That is what is going to stir them. That is what is going to move them. That is what is guiding the hand of God's church and mission around the world. Then we need to get at it. We need to share the gospel. And we need to share ourselves with those who don't know the Lord Jesus. And then finally, we need to encourage each other. We need to encourage Christians everywhere in this global task. So I want to focus on those points this morning. First of all, what does it mean to know Christ? What does it mean to know Christ? We read in the Gospel lesson, the Great Commission. It is a co-mission. It is a mission that God has invited us into by His grace. We are partners with God in mission. One of the things that I think it's important for the church to, 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 to look for in the world is where is God working? And then we must go and join Him in His work. But we need to know the Lord Jesus to be able to do that. We cannot share what we do not know and have not personally experienced for ourselves. In writing to the church in Philippi, Paul said, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. There Paul talks about what it means to know Christ, to know the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of participating in his suffering. Paul was a religious man. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He spoke Hebrew eloquently. He said in terms of keeping the law, he was flawless. And yet God in his infinite wisdom and grace had to strike Saul of Tarsus down on the road to Damascus and open his eyes to not a religion, but a relationship. And Paul said, I want to know Christ. I want to be found in Christ. And God is on a journey to find people all over the world. His Holy Spirit is active, knocking on the doors of our hearts and our minds. And it's important that we respond to him by grace. I graduated from CLBI. Well, I won't tell you how long ago it was. It was a long time ago. Uh, Greg was there. It was a long time ago, wasn't it, Greg? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say I've had a wonderful life of, of, uh, of education, of postgraduate studies, but I would have to say that my, my most intense time of learning was at CLBI, where we spent two years in the Word of God. And I remember during that time, we had some pretty amazing speakers and teachers as these young adults are experiencing these days at CLBI as well. And I remember one year, there was, a, there was a pastor who came. He spoke to us on the book of Romans. It was actually a, a week set aside called Fellowship Week. And it was a week of focus. This pastor came and spoke on Romans, and then he also touched on Paul's words to the church in Philippi. That man later became my father-in-law. He was my wife's father, who was a missionary home on furlough and who came to teach us at CLBI. And I remember his words. I, I don't remember very much of what he said other than this, but it stuck with me. And indeed, it stuck with many of us that week who today are in full-time ministry cross-culturally and in the church here in North America. He said this, The greatest discipline in all of life will be found in Christ, will be to be found in Christ, not in my righteousness, but in His. Not in my righteousness, but in his. Last spring, a man by the name of James Nestigan came to CLBI to teach, and I remember one evening, he was speaking very informally, and here's a man with a PhD in theology. He just said, to have faith, we have to step outside of ourselves, and we have to make Jesus the object of our affection. This is about the power of Jesus within us. To know Christ is to know him personally. And that does not for one minute deny the effect that we have when we bring our little ones to the fountain in baptism. But it's important that we stay plugged in in this relationship to know Christ personally, to know the power of the resurrection, to experience for ourselves that Jesus died for our sins and rose again so we would never have to pay the penalty of sin, which is death. And that each one of us are given the gift of grace for forgiveness now and abundant life now and eternal life forever. This is the good news that we share with a world that is waiting to hear the hope that the Lord Jesus offers. We want to declare the power of the resurrection. And if you don't know that, you can't share that. So first of all, we need to know Christ. We also need to know that this comes with a package deal. In one of the songs we just sang, I think there was a line that said something about if I lay down my life. You see, God calls us to experience the power of the resurrection, but he also calls us to experience the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. As we worship here today, openly and freely at Grace Lutheran Church, our brothers and sisters around the world, particularly in the majority world today, many of them are suffering for their faith. Some of them are sitting in prison in countries like Ethiopia. We have num a number of Ethiopian friends who have been in prison for their faith. Uh, Eritrea today is one of the most closed and isolated countries on the planet. There are literally hundreds of people in prison there today for one reason, their faith. 
Last spring, one of the churches that we relate, last fall, one of the churches that we relate to in Pakistan was attacked on a Sunday morning and 75 believers in Jesus were killed as extremists came against them. This is what we can expect in a world that stands in opposition to the Lord Jesus. We must know the power of the resurrection, but we also need to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. This last week, these young adults had a wonderful teacher with them, Dr. Andy Bannister, who's the chief apologist for the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. One of the things that I appreciate about Andy is the fact that although he's brilliant, he's an Oxford scholar, he goes around the world debating people in university forums as he did this last week here in our area, here in Camrose at Augustana. He taught at CLBI. He was up at Concordia. He was up at the U of A. Engaging in dialogue with Muslims and those who claim to be agnostics and, and atheists. But the bottom line for Andy is that he's a personal Christian. He knows Jesus personally and he knows why he believes. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to, to talk to Dr. Ravi Zacharias, uh, Andy's boss, in Chicago at a conference. And I remember asking Dr. Zacharias, so what's the bottom line in reaching people from other faiths? What's the bottom line in reaching out to people who are Muslims or Hindus? And I never, I'll never forget what Dr. Ra uh, Zacharias said. He said, there's two things. You need to know why you're a follower of Jesus. And you need to be able to share that with people. And the second thing is, you need to love people as Jesus loved them. Our call is to know Christ. Secondly, we need to pray for the advance of His kingdom. Our organization started on the campus of a Bible college coming out of a, a mission prayer group. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and following, we read, Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Greg mentioned this morning that we are a Lutheran missionary sending agency. But beyond that, we are a Lutheran prayer league. We are a group of about 7,500 people scattered across North America who have concerted together and actually agreed with one another that we would pray about the advancement of the kingdom of God. Because we've discovered over the last 75 years that there's no better way to get at the work of the kingdom than to pray about it. So prayer is our working method in mission. As we pray, God hears. As God hears, His Holy Spirit acts. And He raises up people to go. And He raises up people to send those who go. He opens doors as we pray against what's against our workers. God brings down strongholds and doors that we never imagined would open in places like China today and in southern Siberia and Mongolia have opened and we've been able to walk through those doors as people prayed. Last spring we spent some time in Mongolia celebrating the 20th anniversary of an organization there. We found out during those days that people in Sweden began to pray that the door in Mongolia would open up in 1920. In 1922, Mongolia became the second communist nation in the world. Seventy years later, it became a democratic nation. And a year after that, the doors to the gospel opened. And today, the church is not only surviving in Mongolia, it is thriving because God's people prayed. And then we have to get at the work, don't we? We need to share the gospel. And we need to share ourselves with those who do not know the Lord Jesus. It's about proclamation and then it's about demonstration. It's the word. It's sharing the gospel in word and in deed. In James chapter 2, and of course James was the good bishop and pastor at the church in Jerusalem, he declares a twofold focus on mission. And our mission in the church needs to be kind of bifocal for those things that are immediately around us in towns like Camrose and those needs that exist in the interior of Afghanistan or the northwest frontier of Pakistan. James said this, Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in all of this gospel if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? 
For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved, and you say to them, Good morning, friend, be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then you walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? James goes on to say, oh, I can already hear one of you agreeing and saying, it sounds good to me, so you take care of the faith department and I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, they fit together like a hand in a glove. And that comes from the message translation of the good news. We need to declare with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the universe and the only hope for our world. We need to declare with our mouths that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that no person comes to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. And then we need to put that into action. Greg mentioned that Pat grew up in Pakistan. She grew up in an area called the, Hyber, uh, the Pakhtun Hyber uh, uh, province, which used to be called the Northwest Frontier Province, close to the border of Afghanistan. This is Taliban country today, and we still have a hospital operating there. I remember Pat's mom for years had a, ran a little clinic uh, close to that Afghan border. And back in the 1980s, when the Russians had occupied Afghanistan, uh, refugees spilled over the border from Afghanistan and into, into Pakistan, literally by the millions. And so some of them came to her clinic and on one occasion she had the, the happy duty to distribute some of those quilts that some of you women in this church I'm sure have made through the years. Quilts that are distributed by Canadian Lutheran World Relief. And she shared with us about one old man and his family who came uh, through the line and received a quilt and received some food and he said to her, why are you doing this? You're not one of our people. You're not from our country. Why are you doing this? And Pat's mom, who went to be with the Lord this last year, was able to share with this old Pakistani man, the love of Christ constrains us. The Lord Jesus has called us to share the good news that he is Lord, but to also demonstrate the good news as we do works of mercy around the world. This millennial generation is a generation that focuses on justice. They want to see things happen in the world. They want to see things change. They want to see the disenfranchised included in society again. They want the poor to be released. They want the gap between the rich and the poor to be narrowed. That's part of the work of the kingdom as we declare with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and demonstrate with our hands that God loves people and he wants to take care of them. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8 God asks the prophet what does the Lord require of you O man? but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. A few years ago, one of the large relief and development agencies in the U.S. put out a promotional video entitled, Empty Bellies Have No Ears. Did you catch that? Empty bellies have no ears. And it's just what James says. You can't say, God bless you, to someone who's starving. You can't say God bless you to a child who has no opportunity to, to go to school. You need to feed them. You need to build schools. And in the context of that, be Christ and make Christ known with your mouth and with your hands. And finally then, we need to encourage each other in this global task around the world. We've discovered that we can't do this work all by ourselves. So we've been engaged in the joy of partnership around the world. And that means for us crossing denominational lines. Maybe even putting aside, some of, some, aside a few of our Lutheran distinctives and joining hands with believers from around the world to do what we cannot do on our own. And we found this a, a very encouraging task. And we found many, many opportunities to encourage other believers in this task uh, as well. As a prayer league, we need to work with a lot of different kinds of Lutherans to raise up the next generation of goers and senders around the world. One of the things that we try to do within our own fellowship is to encourage people through prayer groups. 
here in cameras we have two young adult prayer groups that meet one's called prayer for the nations the other is called waffles in the world they meet at our house it's young families my pat and i take care of their kids well they pray upstairs about some country of the world or some focus in the world and we have those prayer groups in saskatoon and out in abbotsford and here in cameras and we need to encourage one another in our prayers when i think of this next generation of kingdom workers sometimes they're kind of quirky sometimes they don't look like i do they didn't come dressed this morning in a suit and a clerical collar you know you see god doesn't care what your t-shirt looks like he cares what's in your heart and so we need to encourage the next generation of kingdom workers to go and make disciples of all the people groups baptizing them in the name of the father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and remember I'm with you always to the end of the age oftentimes when some of my friends and my peers who are I'm beyond 60 Greg are, 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 come and tell me and wring their hands about this next generation I just say to them you know friends if you can't get on the way with them just get out of their way because they're moving forward with the gospel and we need to encourage them as such we need to encourage people everywhere in God's church to hang in there, to not just survive, but to thrive and to move forward in mission. Because, as Paul said to that young church worker, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a spirit of self-discipline. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much that you put on flesh and came to us in your Son when we in our best efforts never could have reached you. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given us the gift of grace, the gift of forgiveness, so that we can live abundantly now. Thank you that you conquered the penalty of sin, which is death, so that we can live eternally. Lord, may that eternal hope drive us in this life, just as it did the New Testament apostles and evangelists. Thank you for the hope of glory. Thank you that that's what keeps us going here on earth. Father, we are dependent upon you. Jesus, help us to know you and love you more and more deeply each day. Remind us that prayer changes things and you want to listen to your people. You want to hear from us every single day. Father, help us to share this gospel with our mouths and with our hands. And in the process, may we be encouragers to one another in the task of world mission. Whether it's across the street or around the world, we know that the mission is still the same to proclaim and live the truth in the name of the Lord Jesus. And it is in his name that we ask this. Amen. Amen.